The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, BlackRock Investment Management Australia Limited, ABN 13006 165975, AFSL 230523, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, my name is Chris Carlin. I'm the founder of Mastery Money Now, which was recently acquired by Vista Financial Group. And I'm so excited to be hosting this podcast series about the clients of tomorrow. In these three episodes, brought to you by BlackRock, we'll be discussing ways you can engage with the clients of tomorrow, both from a marketing perspective and also from a process perspective. And we're going to be talking to two fantastic advisors who are already tapping into the advisors of tomorrow. Let's get started. BlackRock's purpose is to help more and more people experience financial well-being. As a fiduciary to investors and a leading provider of financial technology, we help millions of people build savings that serve them throughout their lives by making investing easier and more affordable. For additional information on BlackRock, please visit blackrock.com.au. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever, wherever you are listening to this. It is Chris Carlin here, a podcast host for Amsomnal. And I'm very excited to be meeting up with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Devin King. Devin King has uh, come across from South Africa uh, uh, back about in 2016, I believe. And uh, and after a few uh, practices, um, uh, goes a being an advisor, has started up his own practice. And I think uh, when we're speaking about what does the advisor and practice of the year look like, I think... Uh, uh, looking at Devin King and what he has achieved and what he's continuing to achieve and will achieve in the future uh, certainly ticks that box. So, um, so Devin, great for you to join us. Uh, give us a summary. Uh, who is Devin King? Hey, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Good to be here and good to chat with you. Um, oh, where do I start? Yeah, like you mentioned, I, I've been a financial planner now for over 15 years. Uh, originally in South Africa, where I had my own uh, business for about 10 years. Um, my wife and I moved to Sydney in 2016. We sold, well, I sold that practice. Uh, and yeah, really to start again. Yeah, it's been a, a very exciting, sometimes stressful journey, but overall, very awesome. Fantastic stuff. Um, uh, you know, you've mentioned your wife and you've also got uh, a daughter as well. I do. I have a five year old, Chloe. Yes. Excellent. Well, starting yeah, prep so this she, year. She's in kindy this year. Yeah. This year, yeah. Yep. She was born over here. So, yeah. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic. And we'll come back to Icky Guy Wealth at the moment in a moment. But uh who have you got uh in your team at Icky Guy Wealth? At the moment it's I'm the only advisor. So yeah, we'll get into the business. It's pretty new. Um, I'm the only advisor. I have one support staff and one para planner yep. uh, at the moment. And yeah, we run a pretty tight ship, uh, hoping to expand that on the advice side uh, towards the end of this year. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Exciting times. Uh, and based out of Sydney, aren't you? Correct. Yeah, I'm in yep. Belmaine, just yep. outside the CBD. Fantastic stuff. So, um, yeah, that, I'm looking forward to this chat because I think um, I always find it fascinating uh, those that have come from overseas and have been an advisor in another country. Um, for those who don't know, my wife's a Kiwi, so uh, certainly the discussions of moving to New Zealand. Uh, not that I've done it, but I've certainly had those discussions. So, so let's let's take a step back. Why did you decide to move from South Africa to Australia? Well, it's a very big question. That uh, I got to be careful how I answer it sometimes. Uh, but really, I think. The general stories that you hear about South Africa, beautiful country, um, it was a very tough decision because it was hard to give up my business, which I'd worked very passionately um, in for such a long period of time and grown it to, to something that I really love. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, we felt like we were heavily invested in something that we didn't have a lot of control over in terms of what happened with the economy and the country, sure. that sort of thing. 
and also we wanted to start a family and we were concerned that just like we were leaving our family behind if we didn't leave we would be the ones left behind if our daughter um, mm. chose to move overseas for better opportunities and that so we decided to preempt that and, and move here yeah. Yeah, uh, you've answered that quite, not that I'm an expert on what's going on in South Africa, but I think you've answered that quite uh, diplomatically. It's, uh, uh, it's it, it, and, and puts things in perspective. I mean, uh, we do complain about how things are in Australia from, from an advice perspective, but also from a broader perspective. But it's a fair comment to say that uh, that you would take the problems that you've got in Australia over the problems that are in South Africa or other parts of the world, wouldn't you? A hundred percent, yeah. I think we're very um, protected over here in Australia. And it's something I noticed when I first moved is I noticed a lot of people complaining. I was like, you guys have no idea what it can be like. <laughs> so, yeah, I found that interesting. That's, uh, yes, we don't really know what hard truly is uh, until uh, you've moved um, yeah, until you go overseas. So, um, uh, so what is, let's talk about, um, I guess, financial advice in South Africa. And what I'm really interested in is what do you, because you had your own practice, I think you said you had it for 10 years in South Africa and then you, uh, you did uh, s- uh, sell up. What is one similarity and one, dif- or probably the biggest difference with financial advice between South Africa and Australia? I think a similarity is probably uh, the insurance side of things. So South Africa is very advanced on their insurance products and that sort of thing. I would okay. say their, their insurance products are probably more comprehensive and better. In what uh, way? Than in a, well, you can get 100% income protection there at lower premiums that you pay over here. And that which is interesting given the probably a higher risk being up yeah. there and stuff like that. Um, their trauma cover, which they call dreaded disease cover, is... <laughs> has different ways of structuring it uh, and that sort of thing and not as limiting on the um, underwriting side of things, I would say. Or well, at least it wasn't when I left yeah, seven years sure. ago. Yeah. yeah, dreaded yeah. disease insurance. Now, that is something <laughs> um, I would immediately advocate to change trauma insurance to dreaded <laughs> disease insurance. Um, does South Africa have a, um, like a, a equivalent of a superannuation system? Uh, not compulsory like it is over here okay. so if you work for a big corporate you'll op- often have a pension or what they call a provident fund mm-hmm. uh, which is compulsory if you work for that company but it's not nationwide that everybody has one if you're employed certain companies have it certain don't and then if you work for a company or whatever that doesn't have you know a company-wide pension or provident fund there are retirement benefits similar to the u.s you know like your it's called a retirement annuity uh, sort of thing, which you can take out on a personal capacity, still get certain tax benefits and that sort of thing on them. Yep, fantastic. And what do you think, we saw about similarities, what are some of the differences um, between of advice between South Africa and Australia? So there's some technical uh, differences, um, but what about particularly from a values perspective? What what, what have you I'd noticed there? Definitely compliance. The, mm. yeah, compliance is far more stringent over here in Australia um, than, than South Africa. But on a structure side, I think I think a, South Africa from a holistic perspective is still a little bit, a lot, there are some practices doing it really well, but it still has an element or did when I left of that very salesy element of financial planning, uh, very much, you know, the selling insurance policies, marketing and investment portfolio, which a lot of them you can still get commissions on and that sort of thing as well. Um, so from that perspective, it's very different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. Whereas okay. I feel like in Australia, there's a lot more of the proactive, holistic planning on mm. someone's comprehensive financial life, which I really enjoy. Sure. Yeah. It's much, le- much less about the product, much more about the structure and the and the bigger picture ultimately. Exactly. Hit the nail on the head. It's very much product driven um, over mm. there. Yeah. Yeah. And um I've got to ask about the uh, education uh, requirements. Uh, what did you need to do to become an advisor in Australia? Did you have a degree back in South Africa that you were able to transfer across or did you have to completely start from scratch? That was actually quite a frustrating point in that um, I had a postgrad in financial planning in South Africa and my CFP. Yep. And, you know, I found the um, 
they market your CFP as a very international designation and that. But when I moved over to Australia, I was in a temporary work visa. Mm-hmm. And the FBA at that time said, oh, well, we're not actually registered for international students, so they couldn't do anything with my qualifications at that stage. So it's not as international as you think. Um, and yeah, my postgrad luckily gave me some credits uh, for certain mm-hmm. subjects, but I basically had to do my RG146 covering the superannuation and the tax modules and that sort of thing. I did that when I was still in South Africa before I moved so that I okay. knew I could walk straight into a role when I got here. Yep, fantastic. And then um, did you have to meet a d- degree requirement as well? Yes, yeah, so I still got two credits left to do okay. next year before yep. um, yeah, the end of next year. Sounds like you're well uh, on top of uh, all that and uh, and good luck yeah. to you. Um and I think one part, uh, as we how we spoke uh, prior to this, um, uh, the recording, that uh, when you came to South Africa in 2016, I believe, you then had four different roles in advice in a fairly short period of time before you started your own business. Why was that? And what is your, I guess, your reflection or um, takeaway from that uh, period of time in your career? Oh, I think the takeaway is that everything happens for a reason, because as much as I didn't enjoy having four roles in four years, um, it definitely served its purpose when I explained the process uh, I run in my business. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think the reason behind it is after you've had the freedom to do things the way you want with no one telling you what to do for 10 odd years, um, it's very difficult to go to a practice where you're being told how to do things and often in conflict with how you think they should be done. Uh, So I really struggled with that. And in all honesty, I had never moved to Australia intending to ever start my own practice. I didn't want to start all over again. Um, I I always saw myself as joining a boutique, becoming a partner or something like that, but just never really found a place where I fitted in or felt happy. And after my fourth try, I realized, look, there's only one more option here and that's to do it myself. And yeah, that's how I ended up where I was. That's uh, that's fascinating because um, uh, for those who don't know, I had my own practice. It was recently acquired by uh, Vista Financial Group. And uh, um, so I'm kind of, um, yeah, down the other side, which um, has a lot of pros, but certainly a couple of cons as well. And um, uh, But th- for me, the thought of... Uh, it's one of those things when you start your practice the first time, I think you go in a little bit naive. You're not really, you just see the, all the good bits, but don't realize the pain and costs associated with it. And uh, I think you do that someone... the second time as well. <laughs> yeah, I'll do. Okay. <laughs> so that's what, because uh, I guess one of those things that if you told me when I started my practice in 2018, everything I would have gone through, um, uh, I probably wouldn't have done it uh, despite the uh, rewards at the end. But um how did you, um, I guess, find the uh, energy and motivation to uh, start up your own practice again? Oh, to be honest, in terms of energy and motivation, I feel like I didn't actually have a choice. I felt like I was at a juncture in life where if I don't do this, I'm going to be miserable for you. So, yeah. So, you know, when I started my business, it was just after, it was in between the two lockdowns and COVID. And I was at a point where I wasn't I just didn't feel fulfilled in what I was doing and that sort of thing. And I really missed the business side of things, the marketing, the networking, all that sort of stuff. I like a lot of variety. So being stuck behind a desk or just sitting in front of clients, I find a little bit monotonous. I enjoy doing the other things as well. So yeah, because I enjoy those things, it made sense. Uh, But yeah, I actually went to a life coach because I was not feeling great about where I was and that. And yeah, within eight weeks of seeing that laugh coach, I quit and started my business. Eight weeks? Wow. There was, uh, yeah. what was the something, um, that that's pretty sudden. Um, what was, I guess, your one takeaway point from working with that life coach that made you go, yep, I need to be, start my own business? I think it came down to purpose, uh, which is, you know, falls into the whole name of the business and that sort of thing. I learned about Ikigai as part of that life coaching course I went on. Yeah. Um, and I just felt like I wasn't living my life purpose. I felt like I was, you know, doing a role that was fitting in somewhere, but I wasn't motivated and excited about my future, uh, really. 
Yep. And uh, that made me feel pretty depressed. Uh, so I had to make a big change. I knew it was going to be tough. Didn't yep. know it was going to be as tough as it was, but <laughs> I knew it was, uh, but I wouldn't do it again a hundred times. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, uh, starting a business is hard, but starting a business with a young family, um, as you would have done, is even harder. And um, yeah, it's, uh, but uh, credit to you. And let's, uh, since you've mentioned uh, Ikigai Wealth, let's um, let's talk, go down um, that path because uh, uh, I, I've uh, researching in preparation uh, for our catch up. Um, the more I looked into Ikigai, uh, the more impressed I was with that uh, philosophy. And uh, so what is, let's focus on Ikigai and we'll then talk about how that implements into your practice. So for those who've never heard about Ikigai, which I certainly hadn't before meeting you, what is Ikigai? And so, well, the word Ikigai is actually a Japanese phrase that means a reason for being or a purposeful life. Um, so it's based off Oh, there's a few books on it, but it's based out of um, the concept comes from Okinawa in Japan, where they have the highest concentration per population for centenarians, so people who are over the age of 100. Some research is being done into them and you know, how they live so long and that. And the book is written all about the principles that they um, use in their lives, but the focal point is all about having a purpose. Uh, in order to keep you motivated and keep you young. And that there are a lot of other things as well, but it really focuses around having a purpose in life. That that driving force uh, really, really helps you. Yeah, that's um, fascinating. And I think there is a bit of a, maybe a misconception um, that uh, purpose can come at the expense of profit. So how do you um, – uh, and actually there is a, one of the things that I did see in Ikigai – that uh, it asks four questions. Uh, what are your strengths? What does the world need? What are your passions? And what can you earn a living doing? And I like that because there are two of those questions are looking internally, but two of those questions are looking externally um, and it's what the world needs because you can have passions about something completely random, but if it's not something the world needs and not something the world pays for, then it's kind of like, What's the point? Um, so, how do you balance um, uh, how do you balance passion and profits in uh, in your world? Well, the the four elements that you've mentioned, uh, Ikigai is very is used a lot in the life coaching community, and I'm definitely not mm-hmm. a life coach. I use that as the inspiration behind the planning process that I take people through. Um, but yeah, when it comes to purpose and passion. Yeah, you do have something. You do have to have something that is marketable. But I also believe that very often people have limiting beliefs on how they can earn money and what they can do, mm. and that can be an issue. It's you can think of almost every industry that's there, and you'll have one person who's not making it and one who's making millions. So yeah. you can you can make money doing almost anything if you are passionate and you know how to do it, and that sort of thing. Whereas people immediately say, "Oh, you know, I love." art, but you can't be wealthy as an artist or whatever it might be. I believe there's a lot of limiting beliefs with people around that that subject, and it takes a bit of exploring deeper to break down those uh, belief systems to actually understand what is possible. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, I always use the uh, the cooking industry. Um, uh, yeah, most chefs are not making huge amounts of money, but the top ones, your Gordon Ramsay's, your Jamie Oliver's, etc., cetera, are, are certainly making uh, squillions, that's for sure. And uh, yeah. particularly in a world of social media and uh, TikTok, I think people do actually enjoy those random things and uh, topics that I certainly would not have been uh, interested in uh, in the past. Uh, you do get at least a tiny bit of a – you can get a bit of exposure Um which in turn, uh, for those creating that content, can uh, monetize their passions. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. That's true. So, how do you how do you implement Ikigai into the financial planning um, and industry and your ultimately your practice? Yeah. So, I mean, it came when I mentioned um, you know, having four roles. Obviously, wasn't ideal. The one good thing about it is I learned. For, I worked for for very different businesses, uh, which gave me experience and gave me ideas on creating a holistic offering uh, to people. So, you know, I worked for a 
very big corporate that had 60,000 doctors as clients in Australia. Um, I worked for a millennial practice who focused on advice for very young people, which was heavily around the budgeting, the cash flow management, um, and that sort of thing. And then I worked for a more high net worth um, practice that implemented life planning. So it was going through belief systems and uh, having a vision and that and that marrying your finances together. And yeah, I took all of those elements and put them together. So in terms of purpose and that, my, I believe there's a, I work on the philosophy that there's a lot more to money than money itself. It's a very emotional, sensitive topic in certain areas, and it means different things to everybody. And until you can really understand what money means to you, why it's important to you, and if you had more of it, what you would do with it, you, it's too soon to start planning and setting financial goals. Um, so it's about taking people through to understand what is your purpose, what are you doing here, what is your dream, what is your vision, how do we map that out, and how do we um, implement a strategy that gives you the best opportunity of bringing that vision to life at the end of the day. Um, and that's a very high level of how that works, yeah. Do you get pushback on that? Because I guess I, I think of my own experience when I've especially maybe not with everyday millennials such as nurses and teachers who are probably more focused on uh, getting by. But uh, for those who do have a bit of wealth, I've certainly tried to have some conversations um, in terms of I think there's three levels of wealth, wealth for yourself, wealth for your family, and then wealth for your community or a cause that's greater than yourself. And some people embrace that, but I do get a quite a bit of pushback as well. And uh, they don't say it in these words, but they're just like, I just want to make money for myself. Um, do you yeah. get pushback on that um, on that profit with a purpose um, philosophy you were just talking about? And how do you deal with that? Not as not much. I have in the mm. past, but it's I don't. But it's not linked to any level of wealth. I would say I've had a little bit of pushback from someone who's not massive amounts of money and then some from mm. who have. It's not linked to any sort of uh, uh, demographic or anything like that. But I mean, I'm talking over the last three and a half years, I've had two people who weren't that keen to go through the entire process. But overall, um, yeah, I've had some super wealthy clients. I've got a, a client at the moment who's the CEO of a gaming company. They do all of their work overseas. They're making a ton of money, and he loves the process so much that he's actually paid for his, uh, some of some of his top staff to come and see me as well to go wow. through it. So yeah, it's it, if you, I find also if you're really passionate about something, you generally attract those types of clients as well. Yeah, um, and, and yes, uh, very little pushback. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic, and. Um, uh, yeah, if you can get, uh, you must be doing something right. If you've got a company that's willing to pay for their staff to utilize your services, um, yeah. you've definitely done something right there. So, um, Certainly uh, a nice client to have, yes. Yeah. Uh, so where, let's start with Ikigai Wealth. Where do you think Ikigai Wealth will be in Five years, twenty twenty nine. Let's call it twenty thirty because I like round numbers. Where do you think um, Icky Guy Wealth will be in twenty thirty? Yeah, look, my dream for that period of time is for me to not actually be doing advice anymore. So I would yep. like to have advisors that are doing the client facing, and I would, I would say my ultimate purpose is to grow the business to a point as in to where we are pretty much an educational company. Um, you know, providing all we're still doing financial planning, we're still doing one on one coaching and that, but we're also providing that advice to many through media and that sort of thing. And it's all about driving home the point of financial wellness, not just financial success, yep. you know, and it's differentiating the two. Um, you know, financial success is achieving monetary wealth, financial wellness is all about how positive and confident and happy you feel with your wealth. Now, I believe that if you have financial wellness, you can also achieve financial success. But if you purely strive for the financial success, you're not guaranteed the financial wellness um, on top of that. So it's about changing. It's not about passion over profit or anything like that. I believe money makes people happy, but only if they're using it in conjunction with, with what drives them and you know their purpose and that uh, at the end of the day. So it's about identifying that first and then 
yeah, as wealthy as you can possibly get, that's great. Um, yeah. But it's just with a bit of meaning behind it. It's yeah. Well. Yeah, no, I yeah. like that. Um, yeah. Question that popped up in my head, uh, which linked back to what you were talking about further, that um, that you were an employee that um, uh, but struggled to, I guess, uh, connect with a few of the practice that you worked for. How would you engage with uh, adv- future advisors um, to get them connected in the uh, icky guy way? Yeah, I, you need to have people like that are not there to just do a job at the end of the day. You know, mm. um, you've got to be passionate about money, about success, about other people, uh, and that sort of thing. So it's about finding the right people who are passionate about growing something awesome, not just fulfilling a role uh, at the end of the day. Yep. Um, I don't think everybody has a burning desire to run a business and that. I think it comes a lot from South Africa. In South Africa, when you start as a financial planner, you give you go on a 30-day uh, financial planning course and you're a thief and commission only from day one. There's no base salaries or anything like that. So I had to learn to run a business and prospect and network and that sort of thing. Sure. But in Australia, yep. it's a little bit different. And there are a lot of financial planners who love sitting in front of people loves helping people with their money and that sort of thing, but aren't necessarily trying to start their own business as such. And those would be the type of people that want to be fully engaged, passionate about something bigger than just doing financial planning. It's about creating happiness through money. Um, yep. And, and yeah, so it would be about finding those those people Yep, to join me on that journey. Yeah. Fantastic. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, although with what you said about South Africa, I think that's what Australia was like 20, 30 years ago. So I yep. uh, uh, definitely have uh, heard a few interesting stories uh, before my time on what the industry is like, and I'm glad we've uh, moved away from that. But um, yeah, So, look, you've had significant amount of change in uh, – the last 10 years, um, I'm sure if I asked you in 2014 where you want to be in 2024, this where you are now is probably not uh, your answer. Um, how have you adapted to uh, to these changes? Oh, it's just um, taking it one day at a time. And I, I'm somebody who quite likes change. Uh, I think I get bored easily and staying yeah. the same for too long uh, frustrates me a little bit. So I don't mind things changing. So I yep. think I'm lucky from that respect. But yeah, there has been some big changes. If you'd asked me that in 2014, I hadn't even thought about Australia or, or anything like that. So I would have told you something that I would have liked to have grown that business to, which was a very traditional style financial planning in South Africa sort of thing. So it would look completely different to yep. what I'm trying to do now. Um, yeah, but yeah, that changes. Yeah, take a risk and go after if you really believe in what you're doing. It's important to just do it. Don't be afraid. Make sure you do it. Mm. Calculate. I had a, you know, making a calculated decision. But yeah, it's it's your life, and you only have one. If I had been too afraid to start my business because I knew how tough it was going to be, and that it'd be three and a half years down the track, and I'd still be in the same position I was then. So it's just if there's something you want to do, just do it and deal with the change as you go as best you can. Uh, yeah. And it's just about hanging in there as well. Uh, keeping yes. going. Sometimes, yes, <laughs> just strapping yourself into the roller coaster and uh, you just don't know what's around the corner. I can uh, certainly relate to that. And it was something that actually already also, it's uh, that links to um, Icky Guy as well. That um, I read a comment, someone you'll probably explain this better than I, what I'm about to, but it talks about conserve, be conserved with it most, but risk little. And I think that the way I interpreted it was that if you're going to take a risk to start a business or start a venture or whatever that might be, start small. And um, uh, I guess in the business um, uh, world, we call that get your uh, proof of concept. Um, is that something that uh, that yeah, is it that is, have I got the your interpretation right on that? Yeah, it, to be honest, it's probably not something that I've fully implemented myself. Um, I kind of left with no plan. I had no website. I didn't even know what a licensee was when I quit my job back because I'd only worked for a company. So, yeah, I can't say I ticked that box very well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just reached a point where I was like, I've got to do this. I'll make it work no matter what it looks like. And I'm going to back myself and go. But, yes, 
it is about uh, yeah taking a calculated risk and backing yourself, but also having done some kind of testing to know that you're on the right track and that sort of yep. thing as well. Yeah, for sure. Fa- fantastic. Uh, who is your license yeah. out of curiosity? I'm with Synchron, who have been purchased yes. by Wealth today. Yeah. Ah, excellent, uh, excellent. And yeah, uh, I feel like I got quite lucky in that department as well. They've been fantastic. Uh, that's a very good plug for your uh, for your licensing and compliance team. I'm sure that will be passed on on your next audit. So, uh, but uh, going back to change, I mean, uh, yeah, I know you, uh, you and I are probably people that would enjoy change and uh, not sitting um, doing the same thing over and over again. But uh, there are others, and potentially others in your team now or in the future, who may not be as um, willing to uh, embrace change. Um, how do you have those conversations? Yeah, I'm not too sure because I haven't experienced that yet. But okay. I would hope that that conversation is had up front before they start, and that you know we're working with somebody that's on the same page and wants the same things. Uh, sure. At, at the end of the day, yeah. Yep. Um, I think in order to run a cohesive team, they're going to need to buy into the whole philosophy and be as motivated and excited to do things, you know, in that matter. Um, yeah. And if not, then, yeah, there would have to be a conversation around that. But I think the team has to work together um, with a combined vision uh, for the business. And that. Sure. Yeah. So that's where having a, a rigid hiring process that uh, focuses a lot about those, what you looking to achieve, is this the right fit for you? Yes, fantastic. Come work with us. If not, all good. Hope you find something yeah. else that's uh, more suited for you. And I've gone through that recently because I just hired somebody who, ah, is a, they're in the support role. But, mm. you know, when we did the first interview, they'd already researched Ikigai and they had a lot of comments and questions about it and that sort of thing. And they seemed very excited, um, you know, about being involved in something like that. And I mean, they've been, that person's only been with me for three or four weeks now. And yep. it has been incredible. They're so far up to speed. I've barely had to do anything in terms of training other than yep. running through a few things. And it's, yeah, it's been amazing. So it is possible to, yeah, to pick up that sort of, um, feeling in people and that sort of thing. And yeah, hopefully I could continue to do that going forward. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic. And I guess, I guess your view, um, obviously the financial advice industry has changed significantly. I was going to say the last five years, but since you arrived in uh, 2016, where do you think the advice industry ought to think would be the big changes in the advice for the next five years? I think a similar pr- trajectory on, Adding more value, um, you know, to clients from a, a life perspective, rather than just we're saving you money on your super or your, you know, you know, uh, providing uh, protection for your risk through insurance and that sort of thing, tax efficiencies, and that it, I believe all those things are incredibly important. But it's how they put together as part of the process so that you can actually bring value to someone's life through money mm-hmm. um, and having that. An extra added experience that people go through to bring, you know, bring their finances to life um, and make them more meaningful as well, rather than just money for money's sake. Um, yep. And I think practices that are able to, over the next couple of years, focus on the client experience from a holistic perspective on how are we actually improving their life through their money, rather than just improving their money in isolation. Um, yeah, will go a long way. For the future, definitely, and that is, I think, if we're talking about the practice of tomorrow, that is such a crucial part of it. That it's it's got to be more than just the the dollars and the numbers. It has to be how this applies to me, and how can I use this to um, uh, to better myself, not just financially, but every sphere sphere in my life and those that are closest to me. I think you've absolutely yeah. hit the nail on the head there. Uh, but also helping people to actually understand that a lot of people you meet on don't actually know what's important to them. They've never thought about what their mm. purpose is or what they really want. Um, you know, I always say that people set financial goals based on, we're heavily influenced by our parents, the media, our friends, and that's so it. Just sitting in front of someone and saying, what would you like to plan for? They're going to immediately list off those things. It's about digging deeper and helping them understand what's truly important to them, what truly motivates them, what they really want from their future. And how do we find a way to bring that to life? 
yeah. rather than yep. just something on the surface. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And uh, as a um, uh, one of my clients who's in the uh, psychology field said that um, a problem identified is a problem half solved. And uh, you don't, if you don't know what you're aiming for or um, what problem you're trying to solve or what are you trying to change in your life, then uh, it's very hard to change it until you've actually identified what you want or what you want to change. Yeah, so, no, yeah. Uh, Dem, it's really appreciate the chat. We are running out of time, but I just want to finish uh, with this. And this is a question I ask uh, a lot of people because uh, I'm always fascinated by the answers. But I want to go back to uh, the version of Devon when he first started his practice in South Africa, which, uh, if my math is right, was 2006. Um, If you could go back uh, 18 years uh, to, uh, to, to the version of Devon that was starting his practice and you could speak to, um, that version of Devon, what would be the one thing you would say to them and why? I would tell them to, to focus on their personal growth and their education, not from a compliance perspective, but their broader education in the world in relation to finance and learn from others. I think that there are so many people doing amazing things out there and we often get trapped in our lane and we don't look outside of that and there's so much to learn from people doing unique things. Um, So, you know, read more books um, Mm -hmm. and learn from others doing other stuff and you never know how you're going to pull all that together into something amazing uh, in the future rather than just focusing on the day-to-day getting through writing business or whatever it is you do within your work. It's broadening your horizons and even to other industries. Uh, Yeah, just learn as much as you possibly could. And yeah, that really works on the theory of compounding as well to really benefit you later on. Yep, that makes total sense. The whole uh, concept of working on your business, um, not in your business, that applies to you personally as well. Um, uh, No, that makes total sense. Um, Devin, it's been a privilege. Uh, if those who are listening want to find out more about you or Ikigai Wealth, what's the best way that they can uh, find out more about you? Uh, probably through uh, my website if they want my contact details or yeah. I'm very active on LinkedIn uh, as well. So, yeah, I'd love to connect with people there. It's just Devin King. Uh, yeah, they'll find me. Fantastic stuff. Devin, it's been an absolute privilege uh, having a chat with you and uh, thanks for, thank you for your time and uh, all the best for the future. I'm looking forward to seeing how you evolve and how Ikigai, evo- Ikigai Wealth evolves in the future. That's awesome. Lovely chat. Thanks so much. I really thanks, appreciate Devin. it, Chris. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, Devin.